Welcome to today's Hemp Barons podcast, everyone. I'm host Joy Beckerman, and we have a great guest on the show today, Josh Schneider of Cultivaris. For those of you who have been listening over the past few weeks, you know that I'm using my weekly address to talk about Black Lives Matter. This is critical. At this point, particularly with the recent death now of 27-year-old uh, Black man Rayshard Brooks in Atlanta last week, it's just more important than ever that we use our voice, that we talk about this. We have to have a zero-tolerance policy. Finally, forevermore, it needs to happen now. Those of you who may be conservative or who have been on the fence or have not dared to raise their voice, please, now is your time to speak. We must all now speak and rise and gather together in even greater numbers to bring justice. So let's talk for a minute about Rayshard Brooks, that 27-year-old man whose death now has been ruled a homicide uh, after a formal autopsy in Atlanta last week. In the midst of all of this, all of this protest, all of this gathering, all of the tremendous criminal justice reform that we are finally starting to talk about and implement, Rayshard Brooks falls asleep in a drive through line at Wendy's. You know, there are white college towns all across America where kids fall asleep on the side of the road for one reason or another, or perhaps in a drive through line, and they are gently told to just hop in a Uber, leave their car on the side of the road, and get home safely. That's not how this ended for Rayshard Brooks, an African-American man. After 25 minutes of talking with him, yes, a, a scuffle ensued. That is different than what occurred with George Floyd and others, that this scuffle ensued. Uh, I don't know much about police training. It is surprising to me that those two officers could not restrain um, a single person, just one man that required restraining. They didn't seem to know quite how to handle that. Uh, and then we saw that at some point during that scuffle, Rayshard Brooks indeed was able to commandeer the taser um, of that officer. And from several yards away, while running away, he turned around and pointed that taser at the officer. Now, what's really important to understand here is that a taser is not a deadly weapon. All of the case law in Atlanta, in Georgia, and many other states, if not all states, are very clear that a taser is not a deadly weapon because, believe me, every time a police officer is on the hot seat or on trial for using a taser, they protest that a taser was not a daily weapon, deadly weapon, and in fact, the taser company says the same thing. You're then going to hear folks say, well, it's not a deadly weapon when somebody who's trained in how to use it uses it, and Ray Shardbrooks was not trained, and that it could become a deadly weapon. For example, the, the tasing of the head. Here's the thing. The officer is trained. So the officer knows full well that the taser can only reach so far. The officer was far past the distance of where the taser would even be able to reach him to cause any type of a threat. And also tasers need to reset. They're not automatic pistols where they just keep firing out electricity. They, they fire out what they need to fire out, then they have to reset before they can fire again. There is absolutely no question here that that officer's life was not in danger. And yet he used deadly force shooting Rayshard in the back. Two of those gunshots hit him and killed him. And then while all of those bystanders continued to sit there and record this death, this murder, this incident, those two officers put on plastic gloves and proceeded in front of everybody's cell phone going to clean up the scene <laughs> and to tamper uh, with the evidence and make sure that they got all of their shell casings so that when the forensic units and the Georgia Bureau of Investigations came in, their investigation would be stymied because they had already removed the shell casings. This, guys, is happening right on the heels of at all of these other incidents, the George Floyd incident being the pinnacle to bring us all together and finally speak. The attorney, L. Chris Stewart, um, for the Burke family, who is also the attorney for the Floyd family and so many others, um, had a great press conference where he talked about how it weighs on those lawyers. They do this for a living. They deal with these things. But the weight, the emotional weight of constantly having to visit families 
black families and pretend for the littles, the one-year-olds, the two-year-olds, and in this case, the eight-year-olds, have to sit there and pretend and play with them and smile and make jokes because they have, they're have they completely oblivious to the fact that their parents are dead, their fathers have died, or their mother has died and is not coming back. And in this case, Rayshard Brooks' eight-year-old daughter turned eight the day after he was murdered. And in fact, the day he was murdered, he'd taken her out to paint her toenails and, and her fingernails, and uh, they went out and got a bite to eat together. And the next day, when the lawyers came to talk with the family and discuss with the wife and prepare what was going to happen in the wake of this murder, uh, the, the eight-year-old little girl, Rayshard Brooks' daughter, was sitting there in her Sunday best. Uh, waiting for her dad to come take her to the skate park and and celebrate her birthday party with her. So this is just heartbreaking. Um, it cannot go on. It's at its end. We must finally kill uh, racism. We need sweeping criminal justice reform and a, and a complete restructuring of what policing and emergency response are. And we can do it and we are doing it, but we need your voice. I really appreciate everyone listening to that and joining in. And without further ado, let's get you to Josh Snyder, a horticultural, agricultural, and supply chain genius. You're going to learn about clean stock, genetics, common misperceptions, and you're going to get expert guidance on some of the really important offerings of cultivars for farmers. We want farmers to have a successful experience with this amazing crop every time, and and Josh is going to educate us on how to achieve uh, the highest chance of that success. So get ready for a great interview. I'll see everyone next week. Please speak your truth. Please join in and let your voice be heard. And in the meantime, I'm wishing everyone and their families a great, healthy, and inspiring week. Thanks, everyone. Well, welcome to Hemp Barons today, Josh. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me, Joy. Now, listen, we both know this Rick Fox from Maristem Farms, who is just, we're very lucky to have in hemp, and he's been a, an interviewee here on Hemp Barons and just brings so much to the industry, and he cannot say enough about you, sir, and all that you bring to us as this versatile, valuable crop reemerges and establishes itself in the broad light of day once again among America's agricultural crops. You bring at least 20 years, more, you actually bring more than 20 years from what I understand of, of hands-on experience in retail and wholesale international horticultural uh, uh, industries. And also, of course, this global, global sales and supply chain acumen that you bring, in addition to your being in a breeder and a tissue culturist, which is something we need so much in hemp. You have the CEO and founder of Cultivaris. Please tell the listeners, let's start, uh, what Cultivaris does, and then I want to get into what brought you to hemp. Great. Well, um, Again, thanks for having me, Joy. I'm really excited to be here. And uh, Rick Fox is one of my favorite people. He and I together uh, did a lot of good work in Washington, helping uh, encourage, shall we say, the, the USDA in the best possible direction for the industry, quietly and, and firmly, um, using good science and good sensible policy. And so uh, I, 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 have, I have been in horticulture since 1992, um, 92, yeah. Uh, my first job at a garden center and greenhouse was filling flats uh, for people to put seedlings into. Um, that's some backbreaking work, uh, but it was very educational. Um, a few years later, I started my own garden center and greenhouse where we grew about 7,000 different varieties of plants, collectible plants, and conservatory plant. So with that many plants, you learn a lot about, about the broad uh, need of plant production. Um, I ended up going to work in 2000 for Proven Winners and one of their partner companies, Euro-American Propagators. And that's what brought me from my, my hometown in central Illinois to San Diego, California. Um, and I worked in product development and sales and marketing for Proven Winners. Proven Winners was the company that took vegetatively clonally propagated ornamental plants that you'd find in garden centers internationally. Until, until Proven Winners came along, most ornamental plants were grown from seed. 
and seed breeding had focused on what was convenient for the grower, not how the plants performed for the gardener. And so proven winners took a very different direction and said, we care primarily about garden performance. And just because it's difficult to make work for the greenhouse grower, that's not a good enough reason not to go forward with it. And so that focus on garden performance um, was revolutionary. And everyone said it wouldn't work. And today, I think Proven Winner sells about 200 million plants a year in the U.S. Um, at Home Depot, Lowe's, Walmart, and every independent garden center in the country. <laughs> um, I managed about 50. Yeah, it was a, it was a big, it was a big jump, but I managed about 50 plant breeders around the world. Wow. So we helped them determine the characteristics that they wanted. Sometimes we helped decide what genera and species they were working on and then helped them do selection work. We moved the plants around the world. We trialed them in the U.S., Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, South Africa, um, and all over Europe, and chose the best varieties that performed in each region. And so that gave me a really great uh, portfolio of experience in, in how the breeding process works and, and also clean stock. And so that's where the tissue culture side comes in. Um, and that's that's the approach that I've brought to cultivarist hemp. Um, I I know that there's a lot of variety in my experience, and part of the reason we chose the name cultivarist was because it's from cultivar in Latin meaning, or in in the nomenclature system, a cultivar means a cultivated variety. Yes, and that is cult cultivated variety is is what goes on in my brain. And and just to just to insert quickly here, you know, it's a it's interesting to me. I have been involved in the cannabis movements for for over 30 years. Um and uh but in hemp, we discuss hemp as cultivars and varieties. Now, I realize that we could also call them chemovars, we could call them strains, but I prefer to discuss hemp types as varieties and cultivars and then save the terms chemovars and strains for other types of cannabis, just in terms of vernacular. So as we as we uh, you know develop a dictionary that and terms that we can all rest on. So I very much appreciate you saying that because in hemp all around the world, I mean, if you went to Canada where they have only just recently legalized, you know, um, passed their cannabis act and so on and so forth. And that we're talking about hemp, the hemp farmers would be like, what? <laughs> I mean, they yeah. would get it, but it's just not the common vernacular for the hemp crop. Yeah. It's a, the, this is one of my pet peeves um, about the cannabis industry. In, in my experience, it's not that cannabis people don't know anything. It's just that so much of what they know simply isn't true. And so what I mean by that is, the term, I, I mean, it's, I, I can't tell you how often I'm beating my head against the table arguing with some bro who's decided that his one success in a 1,500 square foot shed somewhere gives him expertise to charge $5,000 a day to farmers growing 100 acres of hemp. Um, that's that's not how I roll. It is important for hemp farmers to get advice from from folks who have experience in hemp or in agricultural crops. You know, it's a it's interesting because um, because you know the reality is that, and we want we want all forms of cannabis to be considered agriculture. We want folks getting into all of those industries to have all of the tax benefits of being involved in agriculture. And yet at the same time, um, many, many states force marijuana or adult and, and medical uh, use cannabis into a horticultural role, which does not have those tax benefits to it. Um, and so it's an interesting double hat where, we're, where as an advocate, I'm saying, consider them to be agriculture. And then as, as a hemp industry leader, I'm saying, but please stay in your yes. lane. Uh, and if you yes. want to be agriculture, but be agriculture culture for adult use and medical cannabis and please let hemp agriculture stay with hemp 
experts. They're not the same crop, and they, for the most part, have very many different uses, obviously, outside of experts. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. The, and I didn't mean to do No, not either. at all. It's, I, I am with you, Joy. I, yeah. My problem is that um, I actually have a lot of experience in a lot of different sectors of plants in various capacities. So working with pharmaceutical companies, working with supplements companies, uh, working in tropical agriculture. I grew up on a corn and bean farm. We had a two acre vegetable garden that was exclusively my responsibility. I was the oldest and the only boy. And so my sisters were like, nope, there's bugs out there. We're out. Um, so I, I love to curate variety and I like to learn. And so I seek out plant nerds and uh, single genus nerds. And so I have my group of cannabis people that I just adore and trust um, because they are evidence-based people, not, not uh, superstition-based people. Um, and so every group that I put together on hemp, I always uh, try to get a, as I call them, you got to have your weed bros involved, and then you got to have your agronomic farmers involved. And the, the, the working together is the best way to have success. I put together a group up in Northern California that was some, some weed bros that were looking to diversify into hemp, uh, some farmers that were looking to get out of prunes, apricots, and olives. And then there was a bunch of Mennonites. And the strangest and most beautiful thing that happened was everybody was looking at each other with side eye in the beginning. And by the end, you had all the Mennonites out with the weed bros under the tree, smoking some joints after the meeting. The Mennonites obviously weren't smoking, but were asking questions and contributing. And so this group coming together has just done some really good work. And I'm so impressed with how they've, the, the opportunity, especially in today's divisive world where everybody's camp A or camp B, um, the fact that hemp is bringing people together around agriculture is something that just warms my heart and makes me smile because agriculture is desperately in need. Of that. And it is really, it's the great synthesizer. All of it's synthesizer. And let's not even get started what happens when we add uh, hemp to industrial sealants and coatings or building materials or, or body care. and oh my it, it synthesizes even all the properties of those. It is the great synthesizer, both figuratively, literally, spiritually, physically. It is just wonderful. And, and I love that you say that too, because a lot of the, the folks, the farmers that really started and rooted the hemp industry um, in Canada, uh, a, a beautiful Jewish woman, Ruth Shammai, and also several Mennonites that are really, you know, pumping out agricultural hemp. So hemp stone for grain up there. And it's just, it's fascinating um, to see it coming together. Those are just brief. Yeah, no, I, I think it's, I love those stories, Joy, because I, I work with a group in Tennessee that is working with um, Amish farmers who grow tobacco. I mean, the ironies. Um, and so they are now doing a percentage of each of their, their acreage in smokable flour, and they're doing a great job with it. Um, my first job, that first job in 92, was actually at a Mennonite-owned greenhouse. Um, so I, I so enjoy that, that being around folks that have a more simple and uh, different approach to life. I, I like different people, and um, it's been such a delight in hemp. I, I spent the last 10 years working in Africa on a project I started with a crop called breadfruit um, because it was discovered by Captain Cook in the 1700s. And he said that it was just this extraordinary crop that could feed people and do so much for humanity. And so my team worked hard to develop a tissue culture protocol to propagate the traditional varieties from the South Pacific. And so over the last 10 years, I planted a half a million trees in 52 countries. Uh, a lot of those countries I was in myself. Um, I was actually in Liberia during the Ebola crisis. Um, it's, it's been a, once all the people are dead, I'll write a book uh, when they can't come get me. But it's, it's, agriculture has been a ticket to the kind of life I never would have imagined when I'm a kid. When I was a kid, I, 
I, I thought farming was just so boring, corn and beans and flat central Illinois. And I, I stayed three weeks with, with, at the home of the president of Nigeria. I've dealt with warlords and escaped uh, death narrowly on so many occasions. Um, you would just not believe. And I, my life has been, I mean, I'm 47, but I started early. And I'm so glad that hemp has come to the surface because now all of my African teams are pivoting to hemp and food and fiber hemp can be so extraordinarily valuable for Africa for building materials alone. But for food and medicine, these are things in short supply and irregular supply. So we've got a project we're setting up in Zambia later this year um, for uh, rosin hemp production. In fact, some of Rick's varieties will be going over there. Um, and I just, I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to, to be a part of the early stages of this movement because I think it can do so much good for the earth, for the farm economy, and it can point us in a new direction. Um, but I know that I'm preaching to the choir. <laughs> no, no. So tell us, Tell us what, just I want to make sure that the listeners really understand the services and and or products that Cultivaris provides. Could you give us sort of the an overview of what Cultivaris does and provides? For sure. Um, based on my experience in ornamental plant, in the ornamental plant business, I saw some opportunities. When I first started in the mid-90s, everybody that was growing ornamentals, geraniums, petunias, et cetera, held their own mother stock. Then Federal Express came along, and it was easier to move plants around as rooted or unrooted cuttings. And what that did was like the Columbian Exchange when Christopher Columbus came here, it'll, it, it loosed a bunch of diseases vectored uh, through insects or humans on plants because of the movement. So as the movement of plants increases, so does the disease profile. Um, within two years, virus and other bacterial and fungal diseases had swept through and destroyed the mother stock systems that were quote vertically integrated every little garden center or greenhouse had their own mother plants and did their own propagation with the with the advent of tissue culture clean stock where we it, and it only works using meristematic tissue culture not nodal culture there's a big difference but we were able to to clean plants of their viruses and we set up this entire clean stock system because our plants were being killed by these viruses and they were wiping out livelihoods. I saw the same thing happening in hemp and cannabis. Hop latent viroid, hop stuck viroid, um, Arabis mosaic virus, alfalfa mosaic virus. There's all these viruses that can cause real problems. And the problem is that the hemp and cannabis industry don't have a clean stock system, and they don't understand how important sanitation and, and uh, starting out with clean stock each year that's virus index tested using qPCR and RNA sequencing. And since I had that experience, I knew that I could set that up in the hemp industry. And so our facility, what we offer is pathogen indexed clean stock that has all gone through tissue culture and is stored in tissue culture. And each year we bring the mother stock out of tissue culture and grow it into mother plants. I don't believe that you should go straight from tissue culture to cultivation because you need time for the plant to level off after coming out of TC. Um, so we bring those plants out and we establish a new block of clean stock every four months over the course of the season. So we're just in the midst of establishing our new group of late summer fall stock. And what we've been propagating on for the last uh, three months will be dumped. And so as a grower, as a farmer, if you start the season out with clean stock that is free of viruses, even if it gets infected over the summer, which it's likely to do because insects transmit these viruses, it won't kill the plants before you can harvest. But if you start with stock that was held over from last year 
and has a latent viral infection, and most viruses you cannot see the, the symptoms until it's too late. And you cannot cure a plant of a virus. There's nothing you can do except meristematic tissue culture to eliminate that virus. And that takes 12 to 24 months in vitro of repeated meristematic culture. So, and, and if we get off onto the seed side, I'll, I'll do some uh, criticism of that. But my, my opinion is that the seed lines have not been established, established long enough to be true to type. So they don't breed true. I think that's a risk. I mean, that's the big issue here. And we talk about it a lot on this show are the exploitation of farmers, some of the most trusting people in the world doing the heaviest listing for us. As we often say, without the top six inches of soil and rainfall, we would all be dead. So farmers are the heroes of the world and of human survivor. They take all the risks. Uh, they are doing this without federal crop insurance for the most part. I understand that it just became available to us this year, and we're very grateful for that. Having said that, the deadline to apply was March 16th. There was a three-week window to do it, and you needed to have a contract in place as part of your application materials. So meanwhile, farmers are, are, are still in this. Now, when it comes to oil, seed, and fiber crops, as you well know, there are established certified pedigreed seeds all over the world now. And side note, as you well know, it doesn't mean that a certified pedigree seed in northern Canada is going to grow so beautifully in Kentucky. And in fact, we found that they don't. And, and we're moving those things forward. But the point is, when it comes to the extract varieties, that's new. I've been in hemp for 30 years and, and extract varieties of hemp hit us like a ton of bricks, blindsided us about, you know, six and seven years ago. So they have not had time to be bred into unique, distinct, and stable varieties. And thus, these unscrupulous seed sellers are selling magic beans to farmers, telling them everything they want to hear, 17% CBD, zero THC, 97% germination rate, totally feminized, and none of that is true. Um, and it's all lies. Yes, it's all lies. It's lies. It's so frustrating to me. I, Joy, I have six farmers who would not listen to me that CBG was overblown and that there is no way that the seed lines could be as stable as people are claiming. And all six of them bought CBG from some big name companies and some smaller companies. And on average, amongst the several thousand seeds they did test germs on, um, 30% of them were high THC at 6% or more. It's unbelievable. And this, we're talking... There were 10 to 20% males. Crop destruction is what we're talking about with non-compliant crops, as you well know. I mean, sure. And negligence. I mean, that's into the negligence territory, which can put you in jail. And negligence. And negligence on top of it, you know. But, but what's worse, when we talk about the males, of course... Nobody is expecting the males to pop up, and yet there they are. So now labor force costs yes. money. To or hermaphrodites. Or hermaphrodites. And you're, and you're paying people that was nowhere near in your business plan as a farmer working on the smallest possible margins yes. that, you, that you've even had in your business plan or your yes. budget, the ability to pay a labor force throughout the summer to do the laborious task of identifying and pulling males and hermaphrodites. Yes, and if and you're assuming that they're going to get it all, and I will tell you, I don't know anybody who's gotten them all. And so what happened was most of the crops that went from seed last year had plenty of seeds on them. And so I, I know a guy who, who ordered in this garbage variety. I won't say what it is, but there were at least 12 distinct phenos inside this variety. He sells them and made 20 million seeds. And he's like, can you help me sell them? And I said, no. And I think you're unethical. Um, I, I don't, I want to see your inbred parent lines for at least 20 generations before I'd even consider 
And so I chose to do clone only production. And that's why I love working with Rick and Janet Maristem. They had created a bunch of hybrids that they selected themselves that were distinct. And so, and I've got phenotypes of stuff like Chardonnay or Berry Blossom. Everything we, we do was, was selected either by an experienced cannabis breeder and so the beauty of breeding for clonal production is you only need one great plant. And so then I put that plant in tissue culture, keep it from getting infected, multiply it out. And I want to give farmers, in my opinion, I, I can lay claim to being one of the fathers of, of breadfruit. And my original idea was it's a basketball sized fruit that produces a potato on a tree, two to 3000 pounds a year. Um, and you can make a gluten-free flour out of it. And so my idea was farmers in the tropics can make money selling gluten-free flour to American ladies that think they're gluten intolerant, and this will help everybody. But also, I had to know what it took to get a market off the ground, because I was working with a plant no one had ever heard of, and there was no market for it. So I have restaurants in Ghana who use it for French fries, Hawaii is full of breadfruit or ulu as they call it, French fries, potato chips, gluten-free flour, bread, cakes, cookies. Um, so we need to have the farmers a sure bet. They should not be speculating. And I think, especially this year, any cultivation with seed is some additional speculation that I don't think is worthwhile. And I know there's great seed breeders out there. I know some of them personally. They're my friends. We work with them. We help them do virus index and cleaning up their mother stock, their breeding lines, because some viruses and viroids are pollen transmissible. So seed isn't going to save you from that. And I'm a big supporter of this. Some of the seed breeding companies actually give me their phenos to sell vegetatively, and we capture a small royalty for them so that they can make money off of their crop, but they're not under pressure to release the, the variety early before it's really ready and leave farmers holding the bag. And so I think for the first few years, um, right this year, because there's so much seed on the market and everybody has dropped their price so drastically, that's creating moral hazard that's pulling more people into cheap seed and away from clones. But what our bright spot has been is our smokable flower program, which some of Rick's Maristem varieties are in that program. And we have our, our Purple Mesa program, which just is a fantastic uh, assortment of old school mentality of cannabis breeding, where we have hemp varieties that have amazing look, smell, and taste. The bag appeal is high. Um, they may not be as productive as something like Spectrum or T1, but the product that they produce is so far superior. And to me, if you're doing an acre or two acres, you should be doing more, you should be more focused on smokable flour because the biomass market is so complicated right now that it's difficult to be profitable in that market without the loop closed. Um, my team also is working on developing relationships so that the people that we work with that are growing our varieties, our young plants, I don't like the word clone because it's not, again, technically accurate in a tissue culture standpoint. A clone is a, a, a narrower categorization than even a cultivated variety. Um, so the young plants or clones that we grow in our greenhouses, um, we are working to find customers for our customers' flower because I believe in closing the loop as much as possible. So I'm working with supplements companies, um, smokable flower people, pre-roll people, um, and a lot of cottage businesses that want access to a reliable supply of high-quality smokable flower grown by farmers, not just giant companies that seem to be in a bankruptcy eight-ball situation. And so this is this is my goal: uh, is that cultivarus hemp supports the farmer from beginning to end. We have a team of educators, of experienced farmers in hemp, agronomists, pathologists, um, and molecular biologists that help us support our customers 
all the way through the season. And hopefully we're, as we're getting more of these deals done for smokable flour and biomass, we have people that we can send our, our young plant customers to, and these, cust- these people will give them contracts to buy their flour. So we're really trying to create a more closed loop system. I don't like vertical integration in cannabis. I don't think it works very well. It's, it's a solution. Yeah, it's a solution to something that people think it's going to solve a problem, but it's a solution that is unnecessary. It's not matched to the problem. And so a lot of times in the cannabis industry, there are solutions out there looking for a problem. And I kind of go the opposite way and spending my life working with farmers, whether you're growing flowers in a greenhouse, bread fruit in the field, or soybeans on a flat piece of ground. What I want is to make sure the farmer has what they need to be successful. And I want to help support that very grassroots um, level of cultivation, because I know so many people whose lives could be dramatically impacted if they could make an extra $20,000 over the summer growing a little patch of hemp. Absolutely. This because I've worked for years with hemp production services in Cal- in uh, Canada, of course, and and while Canadian, you know, breeders are getting into a little bit, very slowly extract hemp, because as you may well know, uh, hemp growers, even though this country of Canada has been regulating the crop as an agricultural commodity federally with crop insurance since 1998, it was only until the passage of the Cannabis Act and then regulations being written and enacted that hemp farmers, for the first time, are now allowed to, as long as they go through the more rigorous medical program, marijuana program, licensing program up there. They can't do it as a hemp processor, extract hemp for cannabinoids. They can do it as a marijuana processor. So it's still very highly uh, regulated there. But in any event, point being, it's not like they've been super focusing on extract varieties of hemp breeding unique, distinct uh, varieties up there. They've been focusing on grain because Canada, and I do hope we catch up very quickly here, but Canada became the world leader in bulk hemp grain food ingredients, cold pressed oil, hulled seeds, protein powder, etc. cetera. Um, and so hemp production services in any event they prov- what you're talking about doing what you're what you're doing with cultivaris for extract varieties and I'll, I'll get to my question in a second they they of course have been doing for grain and it's so important farmers need that support this is not a sunflower sunflower is not only hardly as regulated as the hemp crop here on the uh, heels of hysteria and prohibition, um, but it's a complicated crop. Now, it's not rocket science, but there are tons of complexities here, and you're either going to set yourself up for success or you're not. And randomly buying seeds from unscrupulous seed sellers and randomly planting and not understanding, it, you're not setting yourself up for success. So partnering, even just as a supplier, a strategic partnership, as it were, by utilizing cultivarists' services is helping you to be set up for success. And that brings me to my, my larger issue here and that or not issue, a question I should say, is cultivars is focusing right now on extract varieties. Am I correct? Or are you also sauntering into uh, oil, seed, and fiber at this time? Um, oil, seed, and fiber are something that's on our, on our radar. And we're working with a couple different companies that are doing some really interesting tri-cropping. In, in my opinion, that is the future of everything besides smokable flour. Um, but it's just not there yet. And so um, most of my work in Africa will focus on, it'll probably be 80% um, food and fiber hemp and 20% rosin hemp. Um, because I, I, I just, I don't see the economics working out for uh, vegetative propagation. But since that's what, that's what my, my expertise and my team's expertise is in like, for instance, my head grower, uh, Minerva, uh, I started my career with her at Proven Winners and she produced, she produced 50 million young plants, rooted tissue culture, grown mother stock, 50 million rooted young plants every year for 20 years. I threw 50 to 75 new varieties sometimes in genera that nobody had ever even heard of at her. 
and she hit them out of the park every time. And so our production team is incredibly talented at vegetative propagation. Uh, we also have, we're, we're working with some supplement companies, like I mentioned, to help them scale up the production of, for instance, a new variety of turmeric that has um, a higher cucurmin uh, level um, that one company has developed. So I can use tissue culture to scale up an, a clone of a variety. And the reason I harp on that clone thing is because if I have, say, Girl Scout cookies, I have that variety of cannabis and I put it into tissue culture. The first meristem that I take will be clone one, the second clone two, the third clone three, and so on. And we would trace that clone all the way to the finished product because sometimes there are slight variations even though they are technically clones of the same plant, one clone might grow a little bit differently than the other, or one clone might be prone to um, mutation where, while the other is more stable. And so we, take, we clone these, these uh, supplement plants that are meant for um, supplement uh, vitamins and supplements. And then we are, are, program is that I place these varieties with some of my women's farm cooperatives in Africa. And so they will be growing the turmeric and they get a contract. They want, they want contracts more than they want handouts. And so they want a contract. These are sharp business women who have a group of women that are working together. So they will grow the biomass. The supplements companies get all this great marketing and my ladies in Africa get a recurring consistent business and I can send them new tissue culture plants every year to make sure that there are no disease issues. So that's our approach with cannabis right now to make sure that we can help the both sides of the cannabis industry really understand what viruses do and how damaging they can be. That's what stunt is. When you hear about people in the THC side talking about how much stunting or dudding is happening and that's a dirty little secret on the THC side of California cannabis. A, a whole bunch of varieties were infected. And again, it's like COVID. You can't see it until it's too late. And so this has caused so many production problems because when the viroid, especially with hop latent and hop stunt viroid, and a viroid is an even smaller piece of a virus. Um, that's almost impossible to get rid of. But what happens is the plant doesn't produce any cannabinoids and the flower production is, is reduced by 70 or 80%. And so you have these grows that are doing five and 10,000 plants um, or more. And this virus, because they've not started with clean stock they've, and they spread it through their tools, through their hands, through insects. As an insect jumps from one plant to the next, they can carry the virus on their feet. Um, or their mouth part. And so this is a catastrophic loss that has caused these companies who they were planning to get six or, or seven ounces per plant, and they got one ounce, and it didn't have any THC or CBD in it. So I believe that we can help the industry develop the clean stock protocols that are necessary for us to be successful whatever form we're growing the crop in. It's, it's just key that folks really understand the whole cycle. And as we often say, you know, back in the 90s and late 80s, shooting from the rooftops, it grows anywhere. It's a miracle plant. doesn't take water, doesn't take... Creep out, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and we're doing research on all of these things. Of course, as the plant reestablishes itself in this huge country in all of our different climates and soil types and agricultural schemes, we're discovering all kinds of things that make those protestations that we shouted from the rooftops untrue. Um, and so it's just very important to go into it with eyes wide open, getting that research done. We want farmers to be successful. We we want farmers to reap the opportunities and the promise that this amazing crop has to bring. And there's only one way to do that, and that's to do it carefully, deliberately, and not while we're chasing unicorns of 100,000 and 
$10 million an acre. It's just not, if it sounds too good to be true, guys, it usually is. And hemp and, and cannabis in all of its forms are no exception. I love that even some of the most critical thinkers in the world all of a sudden put on their magical thinking hat when we discuss hemp or cannabis. And, and so, as I often say, please, as much as I love your magical hat and we can get as spiritual as you want, it's really important you keep your critical thinking hat on. <laughs> it's key. It's key. Man, everyone who wants to find Cultivaris, of course, please go to our website and get all of the, the links that we can connect you with to Josh Schneider. Um, Josh, before we end our interview here, is there a message or anything in particular you want to make sure you get across to the listeners before we head off? Well, I think, Joy, um, the key is to ask questions when you're buying plants. Don't be afraid to um, ask a, a firm, hard question. Where did your plants come from? How long have you had them? Have you done virus testing? What were the results? I think that one of the things that I think we're desperately lacking is objective information. And so if people go to my website for Cultivar Attempt, they will see on the blog and the resource side, lots and lots of good information to help educate themselves rather than getting stuck in a morass of bro science and opinion on Instagram. Work hard to learn more about the crop before you get started. And as much as I would like to sell lots more young plants um, from my stock, I generally talk people down. If they're starting with five acres, I push them to just do an acre. Start small and get it right. And then you can expand up and find a partner that you can work with. Like there's plenty of good companies out there, but Cultivar is Hemp, we try and position ourselves as a resource for our customers all the way around. We're going to be hopefully doing field trials across the country this year where we'll have some open days in the autumn before harvest where people can come and look at all 30 of our varieties in the field up against other varieties and see what looks good and what they're interested in and learn more about the characteristics of the crop. So our goal is to constantly be out working to improve the process and the success of the farmer that the farmer has to be open to asking questions and pushing to get answers. Absolutely. And I'm looking right now, I mean, amazing resources that you folks have at Cultivars Hemp. Clean Stock, A Beginner's Guide, Top 7 Questions to Ask Before You Buy Hemp Genetics. I mean, talk about a public service announcement of a website. What great tools. Such a contribution. Josh, I'm going to be excited to have you on the on Hemp Barons again. Can't thank you enough for all that you're doing to be an exemplary steward of this amazing crop. We are indeed so lucky to have you. I'm wishing you and yours good health during this transformative time and a really successful 2020, despite every challenge we see in front of us, brother. May, may all of that uh, success and fulfillment come to you for being so dedicated to this crop. Thank you so much, Joy. That is such kindness that you have spoken, uh, and I so appreciate that. I'm really looking forward to seeing where this is going to take us. Oh, and it's going to take us right into the sunshine, so especially with folks like you on board. Thank you so much again, Josh. Can't wait to have you back. Thanks so much, Joy. We're proud to feature today's episode on the MJ Bulls Cannabis Podcast Network, a platform designed exclusively for cannabis podcasts to share their message with the world. To learn more or to enjoy another great cannabis podcast, go to mjbulls.com or coming soon, download the MJ Bulls app to your Apple or Android phone.